So good morning all, I am Alberto Planas. I work in the feature technology team from Torsten Kukuk, together with uh, Ignaz, Ludwig, Fabian. So we are kind of of diverse team. Uh, and today I want to present the current state of the full disk encryption in, in basically in OpenSUSE, uh, in microOS and in, in Tumbleweed. So first of all, thank you a lot for inviting me here. It was uh, amazing. Actually, I'm learning a lot of stuff here. Something that I learned yesterday is that uh, it's a bad idea to uh, have a diner with uh, some food that is uh, named the minor special. So it's a lot of food for a, for a night. So I'm learning a lot of stuff. So today I want to talk about uh, the current status, what we did during the last few months, what has been released, and what is in the cooking for, for very soon, actually. That's not the first time that I talk, or that we talk about full disk encryption in the context of OpenSUSE. Uh, in previous releases of this talk, we talk about the motivation, why full disk encryption, encryption is a thing. Uh, mostly it's about data protection. So usually you are going to have some data that you want to control the privacy of that. So if you have a laptop and you lost a laptop, you want to be sure that the information contained there remains private. But it's also about data authentication. So if you have a device, a laptop, and there is some modification of this data, this needs to be detected at least. And if everything is OK, the boot process is not going to happen. One example of that is not only about uh, the evil may case, it's a simple rollback attack. So for example, you have a, 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 a service, you are going to, to, you have a CBI that you are not aware, after a while you uh, update your system, and what you want to be sure is that in not moment of time, if the attacker rewrite all your system in the other state, this CBI is going to be present, you don't want that. Uh, but this is not a magic tool. There is not going to be protection against local exploit or remote exploit. So if you have a compromised system with a backdoor, this is considered game over. Uh, for that, you have another different tools, in my VM or remote attestation, that is going to help you to identify this kind of uh, situation. But this is not about that. Uh, but there is a, another kind of motivation beside the technical side. So uh, something that we have in Linux is that we don't have a reference implementation of full disencryption. Microsoft has this BitLocker thingy. Mac OS has the file vault. It's working properly. I mean, some people complain, but it's there, it's secure. People use that. We don't have in Linux. The good thing is that systemd identified, the systemd project identified this lag, and they actually proposing a set of tools that can be combined to build architecture that are going to work for a different distribution. This is a diverse ecosystem. We are part of this ecosystem, and this is a extremely good uh, uh, moment to join this effort upstream, participate on that, uh, try to that in our technology, uh, discuss with upstream uh, the limitation that they have, and mostly share security review. This is a really, really uh, hot topic. Uh, basically, like uh, several months ago, a change in the tooling system D uh, was fixing this kind of security hole that an independent reviewer detected. Um, for this encryption, uh, we need to be very clear, it's not something new for OpenSUSE. We have this traditional model based on two passwords. So basically, we have the bootloader uh, that is grab2, that uh, because the kernel and the init are in this model is going to be part, part in the encrypted part, it's going to ask the password in order to unlock the boot, load the kernel, the init rd. Once the, the kernel is uh, executed and the user space in the init rd is going to execute before the switch root, another purpose is going to be asked. This is kind of inconvenient, but there are workarounds, because you can put in ETC or in bar the key of the looks to, looks to or looks one in that case uh, device, and you can create in ETRDs that are going to drag this key, and you, only go, you are only going to have a question of the password one time. The second one is inside the, the in ETRD, and you, you don't need the, uh, the, the, the second password. But eventually, it's the same model. There are improvement of this improvement, uh, uh, using some patches in group two, you can uh, uh, deliver the password that is, was entered manually into the init RD, uh, modifying the RAM disk. These kind of patches are there, they are working properly, and it's something that we can use. There is even documentation about how to use that. Uh, and the ALT model, or framework one model, is currently 
based on a variant of this model. So Microsoft, some years ago, I think that in February of 22, they published a set of patches on top of GrabDat. I think that is still on the review, so it's not merged upstream. That is going to use the TPN2, um, a partial measure boot process, in order to unlock the key uh, that is going to be used in, in Grab2. And using the patches that we have in Grab2, we can also deliver this same, this same key into the init RD. I mean, this solution is working and is uh, already implemented in that. But uh, System D is proposing something different. Instead of involving the Grab or the bootloader in opening the Lux device, that is something that is not trivial, and actually is something that is moving by itself. We move it from Lux 1 to Lux 2. The, the uh, advised crypto system that we, we are going to use is uh, they are so, are so moving. That means that everything needs to be implemented in the bootloader side. They are proposing to move that into the user space. Uh, that makes, makes a lot of sense for me. That requires change in the layout of the distribution. Now the kernel and initRD needs to be in the clean side, in this case in the ESP. But basically initRD needs to, uh, can use the user space tool to use the TPN to unlock the device using some, something that is going to be a full measure root system. That we can see that, we are going to see that, is an alternative to the discussion that we have early uh, about uh, 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 secure boot. No, it's an alternative of that. Uh, we talk, I mean, I talk a, a lot about TPN2 in different presentations. This talk is not about TPN2, but there are two topics that I want to introduce to make sure that we are sharing the same knowledge. It's a bit of TPN2 at the bootloader specification that are going to be pivotal here in the, in the solution that we are proposing. I mean, uh, we talk a lot, a, a lot about TPN2 in other presentations, remote attestation, in instance of this talk. They are, uh, we can consider that as a maybe virtual, maybe a real hardware, crypto device that have a lot of features. There's a specification that is going to describe what is a TPN2, the different protocols. We are in the version two of this specification, and this specification is really powerful. Uh, beside many features are providing two that are very special for us. One is measure boot, and the other one is ceiling. Measure boot is, an, again, is an alternative to a secure boot. That is what, what it's going to do is that every stage from the firmware, from the very beginning of the booting of the, of the, of the machine, if a TPN is detected in your system, it's going to, uh, after loading the next stage in the boot chain, it's going to calculate a hash that represents this uh, binary blob of this data, and it's going to execute an operation, an extension operation, in one of the internal registers that is inside the TPN. The extension operation, we can see that as a, a non-revocal, so you can go back to the previous value of the extension, and it's basically calculating the, ha the hash, usually SHA-1 or SHA-256, of the current value of the PCR together with the new one that we want to make at the station. This is going to be, uh, is going to make the prediction of this value very dependent of the previous value of the, of the PCR. Eventually, after the boot process ends, at the end, there is going to be a set of PCR register with certain values. Something that you can uh, uh, um, eventually say is that there is a set of those values that are going to represent the state or the healthy state of my system. That means that if someone changes something in the boot uh, chain, something in the firmware, maybe some, some bit in the, in the command line, in the kernel command line, or there is a backdoor in the init RD, eventually the values of the PCR are going to be widely different on, of the one that you expect. So that, that is a tool that we can use to separate good state from bad states. Um, another interesting feature is the ceiling. So you can uh, provide secrets that are going to be unlocked, decrypted by the TPM. Is some policy based, maybe because the policy is something complex, based on the current value of the PCR. If this is matched, the TPM is going to give you the secret that is stored in the in this binary block. Uh, there is another thing that we need to talk about that is the event log. This is not part of the TPN, this is part of the firmware that because the, 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 oh, sorry, the, the PCR are extended and there is a, a 
maybe some random extension, it's going to be very good if we can have a log that is going to contain all the extension that happened since the very beginning of the boot process. And if every event of every extension is uh, registered there, if we have the information of which PCR has been extended, which value, which hash value was used, and some metadata, we can use that in our favor to, to do very cool things. The other concept that we need to understand is the bootloader specification. So this is a concept introduced by systemd boot. Systemd boot is a very trivial, very minimal bootloader that uh, is, I think that is well known. It's a, somehow it's an alternative to grab, but I, I don't think that is a fair thing because it is really, really minimal. It's basically a wrap a, around load image and some code to show the menu entry. So uh, this uh, bootload specification is a document that you can, I mean, you can, you can create pull requests to request chain on that. That is extremely cool. That is going to formalize how the boot entries are expressed in, in the, in the, for the bootloader. This is very cool because it's a way of creating boot entries in a declarative way. So instead of defining, like in, in, in graph, the menu list and writing exactly in which order it's going to happen, you are going to put certain configuration file or certain elements in the ESP and the bootloader is going to read that and create the bootloader uh, menu for you, for your machine. Uh, currently, there are two kinds of specification, type one, type two. Uh, 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 the previous talk, I uh, was talking about uh, the type two, that is the UKI, <laughs> also introduced the type one, that is the configuration file, and this is something very trivial. So this kind of configuration file, for us, is going to have some kind of metadata. It's going to point to the Linux and the initRD and the option, the kernel command line. This is a way to join the triplet that is going to be required, the minimal triplet that is going to be required for having a, a, a boot system. So uh, with this information, we started to work in, in implementing the full disencryption for microS and Tumbleweed. So uh, our first approach of this problem was using something known as signet policies. We need to be honest, it wasn't the first approach. The first approach was using a fixed PCR policy. So if you, your health, the health of your system is represented by a set of PCR, uh, uh, PCR values, the trivial solution is to create a policy that is going to be uh, 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 dependent of this kind of PCR values. But this is not good. I mean, system is supporting that, but this is not a, a right solution. Because if you have an update, you update the kernel or the initRD, those PCR values are not valid anymore. That's not a problem because you can create a new, uh, a new expectation. But because how it is implemented, this is going to require a write in every device that uh, needs to be re-enrolled uh, to express the new PCR values that are going to be valid for the next boot. So this is not a very nice option. So the real alternative for us was the signet policy that was implemented a bit later in system D. Basically, this is a way to separate the unsealing of the LAX2 key from the policy itself. So uh, you can deliver multiple policies that are going to be signed by a private key. Maybe it's your own private key. Maybe it's the private key that SUSE is providing via OBS. Doesn't matter. But the thing that the, if the policy meets and the public key that is going to be in your system is the one that uh, is, is matching or is validating the signature of this policy, you are going to use the policy expressed in this, uh, in this file to do that locking. And this is pretty cool because that means that if the PCR values are going to change, maybe again because you update uh, the kernel, that means that you only need to deliver, maybe create, but deliver a new uh, a PCR policy that is going to be signed by your private key. But you don't need to touch anything more from the system. Um, and this is really cool, actually. From the system D part, there are basically two components that are, we are going to use a lot. One is uh, system D keeps and roll. That is the part. Is somehow it's like a wrapper around your setup. It's very user focused. That is going to help you to, uh, for example, list the key slot in the lax header that are. Uh, active, actively use it, so you can see, okay, there are several key slots, this is a password, but this is also a, a key slot used for the TPM. Uh, this tool can be used to enroll devices, so you, you can enroll your own hard disk or uh, uh, storage device that you have in your system, and you can use 
Besides password, you can use smart cards, Fido2, and TPM with signet policies. But actually, the, the, the new version is supporting a bit more of that. Uh, so this is the user space to, to do the older enrollment and checking of your system. And Team Setup is the other side that is going to read the policy if you are using TPM or maybe requesting a password or checking that the Fido kit that you introduce is a valid one or the, or the certificate that you have in your smart card is the one that you use for the enrollment. Usually this part is going to be executed in the initRD, it's another user space tool that is, depending on the uh, configuration that you have, is going to <coughs> unlock the system using the, 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 the file formats that systemd is expecting. So the only tool that we require is how to sign and create a sign this kind of policy. Systemd is providing systemd measure for doing that. It's, pro it's generating the JSON file that are seen it by your own key or the one that you provide, but it's not good for us because it's very UKI focused. Basically, that means that is generating PCR uh, policies for a subset of the different PCR that we can have. So not good for us, but not a problem. Uh, because we work it in the framework, framework one group two based solution that is also using signal policies, we can reuse the PCR Oracle tool to generate the full set of uh, uh, policies, the full set of policies that are going to include the, the PCR that we are going to, to require for, a, for, 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 for booting. Um, this tool is extremely cool. It's uh, passing the event log, so the event log that contains all the extension. It's, it's going to be passed, uh, it's par uh, parse that and recalculate the hashes based on the metadata. So basically, it's using, okay, this event log was the kernel. That means that I need to read the new kernel and recalculate the hash. See if there is a difference. If, if there is a difference, generate a new policy for, for the next boot. Extremely cool thing. Um, actually, for really using this tool, we need to make change in the C code because for one side, it was not generating the JSON file. That is kind of natural. It's for grab. So changing that was easy. But the amount of extension that you, can, you, are, going to find for, you are going to find for systemd boot and even for grab is much more bigger. So because uh, it's, a, it's a technical detail, but the measure boot used in the grab to solution is only a partial one. We are using the full measure boot. <laughs> so that requires change in the PCR oracle. It's, 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 it's easy thing to do. But eventually, eventually we are able to generate multi-policy JSON file. This is extremely cool because that in a single file, you are going to have multiple signet policies that are going to represent the known good state that we are uh, monitoring in our system. That not only means different snapshots, but can be also different combination of kernels and init ID and kernel command line. So all the good state, all the good elements, even uh, firmware configuration, if you want, can be represented in a, in a single JSON file. We are supporting that. The other, other component that we require is system debit util. I mean, uh, 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 BLS, a bootloader specification, is the real key component that we require. And systemd boot is today the one bootloader that is using that. So that means that SDBUT was uh, instrumental to, uh, um, uh, for us to generate the bootloader entries, this type one configuration file, that are going to represent the correct combination of kernel, kernel, kernel command line and initRD that is going to be able to boot a new snapshot. Having that is kind of trivial to inject calls to the different tools that are going to generate the prediction, in that case, PCR local system, the PCR lot, that is a tool that we are going to see later, to generate the prediction when something changes in your system. So there is a set of hooks, there is a set of, of, of uh, a, a places where you can inject this call, and if new kernel happen or something changes, maybe the chimp bootloader has been updated, new predictions are going to be automatically generated for you. Something that we limit is that for now we are limiting the amount of snapshot for unattended boot for the default snapshot, the active one, and the one that was uh, good now uh, working. So we consider automatic booting for the three snapshots, but uh, there is no limit on that. So you can include more if you want. This encryption tool is a kind of a utility thing that we require for the way that we are installing uh, image-based distribution. Today we are generating for Microsoft Tumbleweed, QCO image that you can run in 
KVM uh, uh, Oxen, that they are not encrypted. They are encrypted during the first boot. So that is a guarantee that the master key user for LAX2 is going to be locally generated, and we are not going to provide any default password, any default anything that needs to be changed. So everything is lo happening locally in the system. It's encrypting the, the device and is using the use fair boot, fair boot modules to enroll the devices that you have locally in your system. It's going to detect if the, there is a TPN, it's going to detect if there is a FIDO key, and depending on the user selection, it's going to use the combination that you want. One very interesting combination that is the recommended one, in case that you have a, lab, a laptop that you don't want a full uh, unattended boot, is TPN plus a PIN. Basically, it's a, a, a way to guarantee like a two-factor authentication thing is something that you have, something that you know. And this is the super advanced uh, uh, user interface that we have for that. Uh, the last component that we require is that because uh, the information that is going to unlock the system is kind of moving, uh, and the init RD is one element that you need to know the, the measurement of that, you can't uh, create a prediction for the init RD and after that inject the prediction in the init RD <laughs> because you are invalidating this prediction. So for that, we, we need a mechanism that is going to mount the ESP and load the policies and the signatures if uh, it's required from the ESP into the init RD, uh, init RD in memory without changing the value of the init RD. So Dracut PCI signature is a very small Dracut module that is going to do that for us. And it's going to provide this information just before the system decrypts that is going to require that. Actually, that is a bad solution. That is clearly a bad solution, but it's the only one that we have today. We require change in system credentials in order to provide this information as a credential that you can, you can even uh, uh, provide more security. But this is a work in progress. We need to make change in the Taiwan uh, system D uh, code. So the, the last decision that we need to, to make is which set of PCR values are, are going to represent the set of good state in the system. So typically it's a decision between a subset of this kind of PCR. There are 24, but basically the, uh, the nine is the last one that is going to represent the, the initial boot status, and 12 is kind of uh, system D boot uh, thingy. So eventually we are going to use the, uh, we are going to, we want to, to lock the system based on the code that we are using for the firmware, that means PCR0 or PCR2. We want to, to lock the, 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 the system based on the bootloader scheme or bootloader whatever we are using together with the kernel, PCR4. Uh, if we are using secure boot and we are providing certain certificate, PCR7 is going to be in place. And PCR9 is going to represent the init RD and the kernel command line. If the kernel is the one that is loading the init RD and kernel command line, that is the case in system debut. But if we are using grab, PCRH is going to be here. Technical detail, not very relevant, but it's a decision we need to make, and we make this decision for you. So that means that now everything is more clear. So we have a very clear uh, mechanism to uh, encrypt a system. So every time that you boot, the first time that you boot the system, there is going to be a, a, a re-encryption step that is going to register locally a recovery key, locally generated for you, and use first boot is going to execute the enrollment, it's going to enroll using system, system decrypt enroll, and it's going to cause to system debit util or update, update prediction to provide the first prediction of the system. Everything local, everything, everything uh, uh, closed. Uh, a normal update, so an, the normal operation is going to require CPRDAP, or transactional update. Uh, eventually, a new snapshot is going to be created if everything is okay, and a snapper that has a hook mechanism is a good chance to call again to update prediction and check if something in the system with the boot chain change and generate prediction based on that. If we are using signed key, we are going to take this moment to use the private key that is stored in the encrypted part to sign this these uh, policies. And making sure that those predictions are available in the ESP for the next, sp next step, that is the, the boot process. So whatever bootloader we are using, that is in bootloader specification, there is a moment that the kernel that are the in and the init RD are going to be read in clean. And inside the init RD, we have uh, this module that is the PCR signature that is going to mount the ESP and provide all the information. Uh, uh, for key setup in order to unlock the rest of the system. So we have this mechanism here. 
But signet policies are extremely cool, but have some drawbacks. I think that, um, in my opinion, the main drawback is that the rollback attack is not really resolved. There are mechanisms, but this is not really resolved. But this is cool because system do, system D255 that happened like some weeks ago, at least happened in, in OpenSUSE, we have a release, is presenting a, an experimental tool that is system DPCR log that is resolving all the, the problem for us. The solution that they are proposing, I think is extremely cool, is that the policy is not going to be stored in, in a file. What is going to be stored is inside the TPN. And you are going to, uh, 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 the, so the TPN have some slot that is a non-volatile RAM, so you can use that whatever, for whatever you want. And you can create policies, you can create new, new kind of policies that they are not signed policies, that I'm going, they are going to unseal the secret if the policy is stored in certain slot in the uh, non-volatile RAM, is meet. So if something changed, you only need to change the non-volatile part of the inside the TPN2, and that's all the thing that you need to do. Uh, for more security, there is a pin, a secret pin, or a pin that you can provide, that only the component that knows this pin can make this chain in the NB run. That, that means that, mean that an attacker can make any chain if that the pin is not known. And luckily for us, the pin is locked using the same policy. That means that if your system is completely healthy, uh, uh, the pin can be unlocked, and an update can happen without user intervention. That is extremely cool. If something goes wrong, you need to enter the pin. Uh, another thing that this is introducing is the concept of component and variation of those components. Uh, the PCR log uh, tool contains a set of verbs that are going to make predictions. That they, that they are basically PCR log files that are stored in bar that is going to have the expected extension that is going to have certain PCR register. But you can have variation of that. That makes a lot of sense. So uh, having a single, for example, you have a configuration file in your firmware, having a single configuration file or configuration that is valid sometimes is not ideal. So maybe there are different variation of the data, uh, the, the firmware configuration that are valid. Another good example is the kernel command line. The, a single kernel command line is not good. I mean, obviously, I don't want to, to, to a kernel command line that have the init equal bash or something like that. That is extremely bad. But maybe instead of quiet, I want to see the debug. That is kind of OK. So you can have variation of those predictions. You can express a, a, a kernel command line that contain the quiet by default, but also remove the quiet. Anything outside that is not going to recognize it. So those files that contain the extension are going to, to be combined using a more rich expression that the TPM provide, that is a policy or that is a way to create this, this combination. But eventually, you are going to have a policy that is expressed as a hash. And this policy is going to be stored in the, in the, in the, in the TPM. Another cool thing about this, this tool is that you have in a single view, you have a parcel of the event log, and you have another column that is, is, is explaining to you which component and which variation is covered by the, the local information that you have. So it's very easy to understand, OK, this PCR is not properly covered. So I need to provide a solution for that. And if something go, goes wrong, you are going to see, it's going to point in you which part of your system has been changed or has been updated and is not covered by the current policy. So it's a very nice tool to debugging and understanding what is happening uh, uh, with the, conf the, with the uh, uh, full disencryption and lock. And it's not trivial to, to do. So uh, understanding what is happening be below that, uh, behind that, is not something trivial to do. Um, so what is the evaluation of this tool? I mean, we have in December a release that was using signet policies. Everything was working properly. And signed several weeks ago, I don't remember, maybe one month, we have a second release that is using, is using the, P the PCR log. It's in, it's in, uh, it's marketed as an experiment, experimental, but we, we do all the changes. And it's working mostly OK. I mean, there are some limitations. The tool is still evolving. We are contributing upstream to make the change. But overall, I personally think that this is the solution that we want for, for us. So eventually, I think that we need to, to drop the, the signal policies and move, move in this model. There are some limitations. For example, there are some. If the ping, you, for, if you, you forgot the ping, or you don't have a very clear way to enter the ping, that means that you need to re enroll your system. This is a bad thing to do. This is something that we can resolve. Eventually, it's more secure and more, more in my opinion, convenient. 
But this is not about system debut. So it's about the bootloader specification. That is the key component that is going to allow us to abstract the bootloader. The good news is that Michael Chang, as commented before, has been backporting certain change that Fedora has, certain patches, that is providing a very minimal bootloader specification from Grab2, and we want that in factory. So that means that it's not, we are not dependent to insistent debut. We are going to use the old Grab2 if we want. I personally prefer the simple solution, but it's a new set decision, not my decision. Um, Using Grab2 and the abstraction of the bootloader specification was absolutely critical, but still required chain PCR oracle. Grab2 is very ad hoc, how they expand certain registers, even uh, overall PCR age, this is a kind of a mess, it's something I want to talk about. Uh, but uh, that required change in the PCR oracle. But for PCR log, zero chain register required. There are, there are some verbs that you can order differently, and it's going to make prediction for Grab2, so nothing to work on, uh, on that. Um, so my point here is that moving for Grab from system debut to Grab is not invalidating anything that we saw before. So the same workflow for enrolling, updating, and booting is exactly the same. The same tool is working there. Demo time. I mean, this is obviously not, not the case. I mean, a screenshot because, I mean, yeah, we remember that this can fail anyway. So it's, it's very boring. It's a, if everything is okay, you start with the UFE firmware. Uh, if you are using system debut, you have the very the textual boot entry. And if you are a scene grab, you have the, the, the equivalent boot entry. I, I need to remember, this is not the normal boot entry. This is an auto-generated bootloader uh, menu based on the files, the bootloader entries that are in this moment in the system. There is no static configuration file. No, this is generated on the fly by, the, by those patches that uh, Grab is providing. If everything is okay, nothing is going to happen, no password is going to be asked, and this full disencryption is going to work, and you have a login problem. If something wrong happened, maybe because you are attacked, or maybe there is a bug in the system, usually it's the second case, and we are providing wrong predictions, a password is going to be asked. And this is, I mean, I, uh, this is a, a, a good point that some people make to me. That, that is wrong, so you don't know why it is failing. So this is something that you need to change. If a power has been asked, is that something happened in the, uh, uh, that was enable, uh, unable to, 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 to open the, the system, and we need to understand why. Um, this is a hot topic, and it's, uh, we have two releases, one for signatures, uh, signet policies, one for, for the new model based on, on PCR log, and we are working right now in having something more stable for uh, Grab2. Uh, this is a, a release that is going to happen. We need to work on that. And there is more documentation, more, more. Uh, we collected this documentation in the wiki, in, uh, in the OpenSUSE wiki. I, I recommend you to, to check that to learn more. And there is a very long blog post that I think that while only, <coughs> only one person told me that was useful. That is the, the, the explain everything that I explained here in more detail, more, with more, uh, uh, Anyway, this is reference documentation, but there is more thing to do. I mean, uh, under our belt, we want to uh, start up streaming certain features that system would have that eventually bootctl should have. I mean, I didn't show that, but something very cool is that we are using bootctl to manage the boot entries that Grab is going to read. I think that is the final hack. Uh, um, uh, again, the code PCR signature is the wrong solution, and we need to make improvement upstream for type one, uh, 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 type one entries that is going to support better credentials. Uh, another requirement is that uh, we need more debugging information when something goes wrong, more very clear message to the user that uh, something has not been uh, working properly, and we need to, to make uh, more progress in the Grab DLS uh, uh, problem. So, the VLS patch is not complete, it's not covering the full type one, but for now it's enough to have the, the solution implemented. We want that into factory, and we want to uh, uh, resolve some scriptlet uses. So Grab2 has his own scriptless, and we want to 
integrate the system debut util calls in those scripts. And we want to recover the grab to theme. So the theme, because how a grab is working, is expected to be in a slash boot, and it's not working with the current solution, but this is something that we can fix. And we have only one distribution based on uh, 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 image-based uh, installation, but we want to integrate that into Jazz. So in Jazz or Agama, whatever installer we are going to use, we want to explain to the user that we want a full disencryption, and this happens automatically. So the enrollment, the encryption, the enrollment, the creation of the key slot, and the enrollment of the FIDO key or the TPN is going to happen transparently for you for any kind of installation. And overall, fixing back, I think that uh, it's a technological preview uh, solution, and from time to time we find, we find bugs <laughs> and a massive list of improvements that I don't have here. So basically, this is all that I wanted to talk, so I'm very happy that I have time. So I don't know if you guys have questions. Um, do you provide a kind of update path if you now have full disk encryption with a leap system that I can go to the TPM one, or do I have to reinstall the system? So, uh, you, you, if you are using TPM one, there is no you can use this solution. If you are not using UFI, you can't use this solution because TPM two is binding to UFI. Um, you can manually migrate from one place to another. I did that several times. It's not very complicated. Maybe the only complicated part is to rank keep your system, but keep setup is a very nice tool that helps you to undoing that. So it's something that you can do manually. You can you can bootstrap your system, and from not in keeps a, a, a device, you can have one that has a full disencryption. We have the tool to make the enrollment. So once the system is encrypted, you can create the TPN enrollment or the feed key enrollment using, a, using our skip. So this is not automatic. It's a, something that can be documented. Actually, it's documented in the wiki page. But uh, there are a lot of corner cases that something wrong can happen. So better not to do that automatically and do that yourself. I mean, I know several people that did that, and it's working. OK, thanks. Very cool, thank you. Um, the part where the users ask for questions, so you already mentioned that you need to improve the error message at this point. Huh? This seems kind of tricky because um, either this is extremely rare and you can tell users, okay, something really bad happened, you need to step back, huh? or it is something that happens from time to time and then it's kind of tricky to detect a real yeah. attack. Uh, have you thought about it? Yeah, I mean, the, this, is a, this, is, this is relevant, absolutely relevant. I mean, the, the target is that the prediction should work always. So the, I, I, I'm not able to deliver software without bugs. But eventually, the amount of bugs are going to be very rare. So the prediction should work always because you have all the information. There is nothing outside that... Uh, uh, the reach of those tools and all the information is local and should work. That means that if you have an attack, I mean, basically, the goal is that asking a password is a synonym of that you have been compromised. But today, um, you need to log and check the event log to understand which element has been changed. To evaluate yourself if this is a compromise or an update in the firmware that you were not aware. So that evaluation is a, how to report that um, is tricky. I mean, you have the information to detect that. So the, uh, we discussed how to do that. I don't have a clear picture, but you have the information in the event log, and you have the information that was the, how the policy has been built. And you can compare the PCR extension. The element that has been different is pointing you to is pointing <coughs> to you to the PCR that is not have, is not having the current extension, and the PCR have implicitly a meaning. So PCR zero and PCR two represent the firmware. If this evaluation change, that means that something changed in the in firmware because it's code. That means that probably the firmware has been changed. If it's a unaware an unaware update 
or is a hack is something that is hard to understand. But if the PCR pointed is PCR9, that means that it's the kernel command line or the init are the one that suffer a hack that is eventually pointing to you that this is not an update, it is a normal compromise system. So it's, there is this heuristics that you can use and that can improve the error message. So very early in the process, probably uh, something goes wrong with the tool, very late in the process, that is very bad sign. Um, so I have, I have modified my Android system. When I boot it, I get this message that I should go to a URL and uh, check out uh, information yeah. there because mm. I think that if you talk to users about PCRs or in no. or something, no. because then they will not understand anything. So this needs no. to be something that is really thought through that they have a chance of actually understanding this. Otherwise, they will just... It's not trivial. Ignore them. I mean, but this is something to work on, I think. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, maybe a dumb question there. Um, the KXEC or the crash dump, that is not relevant with the, that one. The, the, sorry? KXEC uh, yeah. crash dump. Ah, yeah. Uh, okay, that, that, that's, uh, yeah. I mean, yes, I mean, with, with KX, the PCR is going to change uh, oh. in a very hard way to predict. But the, let's say that this is a work in progress, yes. The prediction of the KX and the soft reboot are, 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 is aware that this is need, uh, some tweaks. All the tooling is here, but this requires some tweaks. There are some uh, manual extensions that system D can do to tell you that, okay, this is not the first boot. This is uh, a, a, mm. another in instance of a boot yeah. can be the soft boot, can exit or something like that. And, and you can represent that as a variant of this component. So uh, system D and the current tooling have a solution for that. What is missing is how to represent that in the script. So yeah, uh, more work. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you.